Thank you, uh, Ruben. So, uh, Ruben just asked me before the for the talk, like, uh, is this the uh, worldwide event release event for for uh, DZOS 112? Unfortunately, not. But it's it's been out now for a month or so, I think, something like something like that. And there's there's two main. Uh, yeah, new features um, in, in this product that we're gonna discuss uh, today. Um, one is uh, our Jupyter Notebook service, basically Jupyter as a service. This is really uh, to make your full machine learning, AI, data service pipeline po possible, easy for your developers. That's a topic that uh, Jörg will be uh, uh, mostly covering uh, later, later on. Uh, I myself will be um, uh, mainly uh, looking at the new high, uh, high <coughs> sorry, high definition, uh, uh, high density it is, high density multi-Kubernetes in uh, one one twelve, and that's a real new game changer in the whole Kubernetes uh, uh, world. So, <coughs> in the beginning, uh, or actually in the past, people were working on containers, creating their, their Docker images, and like, oh cool, I can do Docker run, and I've got a container running on my laptop. Very cool, very cool. Um, that's the past, and actually the whole container technology has been in the Linux kernel for well, more than a decade. It's, uh, it's not something really new. It's uh, actually only reason that people wanted to, you know, have more Docker containers running uh, on multiple systems and as you see that that becomes a bit uh, uh, a bit challenging and then Google open sourced um, uh, Kubernetes and then suddenly the whole world thought like Kubernetes, Kubernetes containers that's the real new thing this is the the next big thing I need to have that on my resume because you know I'll get calls from all the headhunters and actually, if you put just Kubernetes in your tagline on LinkedIn, you'll get the same day you'll get a call. That's uh, that's 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 assured. But for example, in DCOS with Mesos and Marathon as a scheduler, most of the things you can do with Kubernetes today, you could already do. Uh, so in the past, we've seen a lot of uh, people compare Kubernetes to Mesos and then actually actually Marathon. Uh, and to be honest, that is not really, really fair. And I hope after my talk, we'll see why the combination actually makes uh, a lot of uh, sense. So you probably are one of the people that say, okay, yeah, I want to do uh, Kubernetes. So what's the next uh, step? Well, actually what you then need is something like this. And this is really a simple diagram on how Kubernetes basically what, what elements there are. So, so if your configuration, a server, an API server, a scheduler, <coughs> a manager, you have your kubelets that are actually the machines that execute the, uh, the, the containers. And setting that all up, well, you can do it on your laptop, of course, but that's not the whole idea of, uh, of running uh, Kubernetes. You can do like mini, uh, mini cube or, or whatever. Uh, <coughs> so, you go to the Kubernetes website and you look at the, the basically the, the extensive documentation, like how do I set up Kubernetes? And to be honest, that that is possible and takes you a while and then probably at 3 a.m. you've got something like this. Uh, not really enterprise uh, ready, I think. Uh, so to do, to fix that, uh, well, to, to be honest, it, what ha what now uh, <coughs> happens is that a lot of companies see sort of shadow IT in their company with uh, with developers asking for, for a few v VMs, installing their own flavor of Kubernetes, maybe using some uh, some automated uh, tools and scripts to uh, to uh, deploy. But generally, that means that there's a lot of server sprawl. Uh, there's a lot of underused. Uh, uh, machines and uh, there's a lot of trouble of getting everything in, in shape, especially for central, uh, central IT. And then the central IT also is like, okay, uh, what do I do if I need to upgrade? 
You know, uh, is there anyone here in the room that has been successfully updating and working a bit larger Kubernetes cluster from one version? I already thought that Alessandro would, uh, would, uh, would uh, raise his hand, but um, Alessandro, it is difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So, so that is a big, uh, big, uh, big challenge. So you've got your uh, the manual way. You've got some configuration and management uh, tools that are available, basically for deployment, and that works quite well. It, you can get up a Kubernetes cluster relatively easily. You've got some Ansible scripts available that that will help you to get a sort of standard deployment. And the most easy thing, you've got cloud providers where you can just order it, put in your credit card, and you've got it up and running. You see our logo there as well, because we provide that as a service on top of anything. Uh, so with Mesosphere DCOS, you can actually automate and get the same experience you get from, uh, from Google, from Amazon, from Azure, uh, with their, their specific Kubernetes uh, offerings, um, but then in a controlled way and without any uh, lock-in. So, just to give you some statistics, there's actually over 70 ways to deploy Kubernetes, more than 70 uh, ways. And if you look at a traditional enterprise, uh, or, or like an average enterprise, there's like 50, they have 15 Kubernetes clusters in their, in their environment. I mean, some larger companies have many more, some smaller have maybe only like their dev, test, acceptance, production cluster, but you always have multiple, uh, uh, multiple clusters. And, you know, they're generally not managed by central IT because, to be honest, most central IT don't know at all what Kubernetes is and how they need to manage that. It's just too, uh, too, uh, too difficult. So, um, and the 84% is basically, and, and that's maybe interesting, most Kubernetes clusters are smaller than 25 nodes, like 84%. Like so that's a real big, big majority. So that means that there's a lot of small clusters, which is like a lot of headache to, uh, to manage. So <clears throat> basically, the whole environment is therefore fragmented, and, and there's a lot of uh, under, uh, underused uh, systems. So. Uh, what we do is we console uh, with DCOS and, and our new um, 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 uh, Kubernetes engine, we allow you to have multiple Kubernetes clusters on the same infrastructure, on the same hardware. So you don't have to specify dedicated nodes for a specific Kubernetes cluster. You can have them layered on top of each other. So you consolidate all of that and make optimal use of your infrastructure. Uh, the high density multi uh, uh, multi Kubernetes uh, solution. Uh, we also allow uh, customers to actually easily pick which version of Kubernetes they want. Imagine a development team that has created an application uh, within uh, Kubernetes. Everything works fine. Is in production full force, and then a new uh, another development team says, "Yeah, but I, we want to start developing a new application, and we we actually want this." XYZ new feature that's in a newer version of, uh, of, of Kubernetes. Are you going to then update your Kubernetes with your full production workload to allow that developer to do that? No. So what we can do is we can have multiple different versions of Kubernetes running at the same time as well. Um, with full isolation as well because of course Kubernetes allows you to create namespaces and, uh, and assign a namespace to a, a team or, or a tenant. Uh, this is full separated, so that means that a developer, if you want, can actually control the full Kubernetes and, uh, environment. And the, the most important thing is what, what, we, what we can do, we can integrate it with data service. And of course now that Kubernetes has like the, the stateful sets uh, features, we see, and, and operators, we see more and more uh, data service trying to be landed on Kubernetes, but we're f far from the point that we can actually uh, reliably uh, do, uh, do data service on Kubernetes. So if you land the data service on D 
DCOS assigned to it and actually can integrate with your, your apps in Kubernetes. That's an ideal combination in our, uh, in our mind. So, <coughs> again, uh, if you can have like a centralized self-service control plane, which DCOS is, so you can basically assign a developer its own, to its own credentials, can create its own Kubernetes cluster, control that himself, uh, can do that on physical, on, on virtual, or public cloud infrastructure, and also a combination of, uh, of that. So it allows you to, for a developer to develop something online and move it uh, and take it in production anywhere you want, but also within different cloud providers as well. And uh, if you look at the price point of Amazon's uh, data services and Amazon's um, Kubernetes service, you'll see that that bill adds up quite quickly compared to um, running it on just normal EC2 instances. So DCOS allows you to uh, just consume commodity vir virtual uh, machines from a cloud provider or your existing uh, uh, virtual machine uh, infrastructure. So <coughs> this is an example of uh, how that looks like from the, from the UI perspective. So you've got some CSCD, uh, uh, some data service, and you have got your Kubernetes, and we, we see that we have uh, actually three different Kubernetes uh, uh, clusters uh, running. You can see exactly which version they're, uh, uh, they're running, where they are running, uh, and what, what the resources they're consuming. So we now see like a, uh, I would say, a, a sysadmin that controls the whole system view, but of course uh, with uh, RBAC, you could say a developer only sees parts that he is in. It, um, he's allowed to uh, see and the data service that he, only he is allowed to, uh, to use. If you compare why, why this uh, infrastructure saving comes from, is of course you can do normal VMs and provision multiple OSs on, on VMs and then install your Kubernetes on that, but it adds up. It just stacks, stacks up and therefore uh, you waste your resources, whereas with uh, DCOS, you have like a hardware, you have one time the OS and then multiple clusters on that. So on average, you, uh, you save more than 50% on your infrastructure bill. So that's a big, uh, big uh, cost saving and that's really new because before in DCOS running Kubernetes, you needed to assign uh, a set of nodes for a specific Kubernetes cluster. You could not uh, do the do the stacking uh, as well, and that's uh, new in the 112 uh, release. Um, <coughs> what it also allows you um, is that it, it, it what Kubernetes does for your application it monitors it, restarts it if it if it if it fails. That is what we do for Kubernetes. So it's completely self-healing. So if a kubelet fails or whatever. Uh, it automatically starts it up uh, again. Simple provisioning, but also the upgrades. So uh, um, push button scaling. If you need to scale out, you can just scale scale up and uh, and down. Um, it's fully uh, uh, secured, so all the TLS uh, certificates are are de by default installed. So you need to no need to tinkering uh, to do that uh, at a later stage as well. And easy upgrades is. I think the most, uh, one of the real cool, uh, cool features and to do through um, tenant segregation on the networking side as well, we include Calico networking uh, by, by default in the, in the product. We basically offer uh, with DCOS nowadays really one big infrastructure for anything uh, with your containers or your data services and combine it all in one big infrastructure. So for central IT, it means they only need to provide, for example, VMs or AWS account or, or uh, things like that. Just deploy the DCOS agent on them and uh, the rest is, uh, is handled automatically by the, by, the, by the system. So instead of having silos for every single data service, you can actually uh, take that, uh, that, that all. 
So uh, before I jump into the demo, there's one, one thing you might have noticed on Twitter uh, as well. There's now a Mesos Mini. So for developers that are interested to, to tinker on Mesos, as, uh, uh, you can just do a Docker run back to the single container. <laughs> like I said, uh, um, we'll share the slides after the event. But if you uh, have a QR phone, you can actually uh, scan, the, scan the code as well. Uh, single download that you can use that to test new features in Mesos. Again, uh, it's not DCOS, but it's uh, for, for people that are interested to, uh, to learn what Mesos does. Uh, it's quite a cool, cool thing. Uh, so let me actually uh, jump into the demo and switch screens. I just set up a, a small uh, AWS uh, cluster with relatively small, uh, small machines added some data services, um, and what you'll see here is this, this service, Kubernetes, is what we call our uh, Mesosphere Kubernetes engine. This is the, the part that arranges all the other, other clusters, so either through the, through the UI or through, a, um, through the CLI, you can add another cluster. So we've got uh, two folders, one for dev, one for production, and in those folders you'll see that there's separate uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, running. So if we go to, for example, dev, you'll see that, uh, that we've got here some Jenkins as well, because again, a de developer needs some, uh, some, uh, some management of building his, uh, his, his applications. Um, so let me actually switch to my uh, terminal. So I'm now connected to the, to the production. What DCOS also does is uh, I've configured a load balancer from the outside to, to actually route also the, the, the correct traffic to the right Kubernetes uh, cluster. So I can easily switch between contacts um, uh, of, the, of the cluster as uh, well. Um, and the, the nice thing is you can do many of these commands also through the normal DCOS uh, command line, uh, but I'm using the uh, the standard, uh, the normal one. Uh, so if I do config, um, um, so I, I can do um, Go back to prod. So uh, I've now just deployed uh, two um, two uh, two clusters, but using an API or the CLI or 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 through the command line, uh, we could uh, add another um, um, cluster. So let me switch to the CLI. So. You see, this is the Kubernetes engine. We already uh, installed that. Um, and then, actually, you can uh, just add a cluster. Um, and then, so, again, everything can also be uh, handled through, through a Git repository where you save your configuration. So you really have sort of infrastructure as uh, code. So everything that you see here, uh, you can set up uh, an JSON file, so you can use the UI to configure or modify and then, then export a JSON, uh, JSON uh, a file. You specify the CPUs, how, many, uh, how large it needs to uh, be, what the, the secrets are that to, to access the cluster, things like, uh, like that. And just click re uh, run and a few minutes later the cluster is available. Um, often in development it's like Try fast, fail fast, uh, and that accelerates your development. So this really allows the developer to quickly spin up services. Do not need to wait 
for, for central IT to provision something. So the, the, the same feeling, the same experience you get from, um, from uh, using those kind of Kubernetes services online from the cloud providers you can handle with, uh, with DCOs uh, it, uh, itself. Um, now, like, like any, any service uh, within uh, DCOS, it, it uses the two-step scheduling. So <laughs> it means that the, the Kubernetes cluster, um, 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 the MKE engine uh, that, that is required, first of all, is only required to create new clusters, things like, uh, things like uh, that. Uh, because that then, when you s start at an actual cluster, um, it will, uh, again, it will start up basically a single container that will set up or scale up or, or upgrade uh, the full uh, Kubernetes cluster. So the intelligence is in that, I would say, um, cluster container that is being started up. If, the, if you kill that, it will be restarted up and we'll actually see, okay, uh, oh, am I healthy? Yes, okay, I don't need to do anything. Because all the other containers uh, running, for example, within Kubernetes, those are handled by, by Kubernetes. The single container manages the Kubernetes deployment or basically the, the whole, all the services of Kubernetes itself. So it makes sure that uh, if something fails, an etcd server fails, that it knows how to repair that, how to respin that up. And then the marathon scheduler actually only monitors that single uh, single container. So it's, uh, that's, in that sense, a fail-safe uh, solution. And it also uh, makes sure that we don't add any real overhead like, uh, like, uh, like normally you do with installing an OS on a VM. Um, because it's like a, just a tiny agent uh, that is uh, running on the... Uh, on the actually the core operating system. So if that was all, then I want to thank you very much and invite Jörg uh, to the to the stage. <laughs>